Sholem Aleikum, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. Hello everyone, this is Release Day Part 3. If you have not seen this, if you are just tuning into this part, I strongly suggest that you go back and view Release Day Part 1 and Release Day Part 2. This video footage and the man speaking is Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, Chairman of the Revolution of the Bundes Movement. This was live streamed on Facebook by Dr. Weisfeld on April 8th of 2019. Now the third wave of immigration into the Zionist state was from Russia. There there was a big campaign promoted by the Zionists, but which was legitimate, calling for a Jewish, uh, Jewish rights. Let's advance here, you know, because we're waiting for Gadir to be released from the prison, but they're delaying it. It's getting, uh, there's always problems. So there's about two million uh, Jewish Russians, or half Jewish Russians, you know, because there was a lot of assimilation in Russia, in which many Jewish people, you know, were married with Christians. Because under the Communist Party rule, the uh, Jewish culture was banned. The synagogues were not allowed to operate, but churches were, you know, the Orthodox, you know, uh, church was allowed, you know, because basically it was a nationalist uh, regime uh, based upon uh, the identity provided by the uh, Orthodox uh, Russian church. So the Jewish people, you know, uh, were subjected to various waves of anti-Semitism. The first one was uh, in, uh, just after the war when uh, Stalin decided that uh, the Jewish doctors were out to kill him. When in fact they had been, probably been keeping him alive in his necropic state. And Uh, but, uh, you know, there was uh, no way to get any, you know, uh, Jewish civil rights in Russia. The Jewish identity was, you know, banned, you know, based upon a 19, 1848 pamphlet written by Marx called On the Jewish Question, a question which doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned, and which uh, formed the basis of the, um, uh, the uh, Communist Party ideology which uh, decreed that uh, the Jewish people should assimilate and should not exist. This was an um, unhistoric nation, quote-unquote, which uh, had no right to exist, according to uh, communist ideology or Marxist ideology. So, what happens is that the, uh, the Jewish people in Russia, you know, figure, oh, well, this is a, a way to get out, you know, of this dictatorship. And... Uh, and also a way to uh, regain their right, proper identity. So they came to uh, Palestine in order to do so. Why to Palestine? I mean, you know, like, why not just leave Russia, you know, if this campaign was uh, having its effect and uh, becoming a big embarrassment, you know, for, for, uh, for the uh, USSR in the world. So why not uh, leave, you know, under such, you know, uh, uh, pressure? and, and uh, find another place to live. Well, they did. Where did they go at first? To Germany. Yes, to Germany. Until Israel told Germany, cut that out. Don't let any Jewish refugees into Germany. <laughs> so, Israel was asking Germany to institute an anti-Jewish uh, immigration policy. So Israel was a source of anti-Semitism. So Germany shut the doors to the Russian Jewish uh, immigration and they had nowhere else to go but to Palestine again. So two million uh, Jewish Russians came to Palestine and the percentage of, uh, oh, another Jeep came to uh, Palestine and the uh, a percentage uh, of the Jewish Arab population decreased from 70% to 50%, which it is now. Hi. 
So. But, and uh, then the, uh, the Russian Jewish population prospered to some extent and they're still using Russian. There's even Russian paper, newspaper there which circulates for them. And uh, that's the way it is. One, two, three waves of immigration that have filled up uh, the occupied territory of Palestine and the Zionist project continues. Now, we have the settlements. The settlements are expanding and the money is being poured into the occupation of the West Bank. And it is now proposed that the West Bank uh, settlements in throughout the sector C here, which is about 60% of the West Bank, we're talking about not a portion. When you talk about settlements, you talk about the settlements together with all of the lands around the settlements and all of the roads to the settlements and all of the prospective, you know, lands around the settlements as well. All that is uh, proposed for annexation now by Netanyahu in this current election campaign. So how do they expect to fill up these lands? Because, you know, there's only 400,000 settlers and, and there's two and a half million Palestinians. So the idea is to outnumber the Palestinians. So what will they do? The strategy is another wave of immigrants. And how is this fourth wave of immigrants for Zionist settlers to be accomplished? Well, you know, the enticements, you know, to live in a settlement uh, with, um, you know, multiple subsidies and uh, free housing, basically, uh, free land with all the services, modern facilities, and even a university at REL, you know. Okay, if that's not enough to attract, you know, uh, Jewish people from elsewhere in the world, what can the Zionists do? Ah, here it is. The basic supporters of Zionism in the world today are not the Jewish people. The majority of the Jewish people who live outside of Israel still do not want to go to live in Israel. And the strategy of the Zionists to induce them to come and live in Israel is this. The main body of support for Zionism and the Zionist state is, is what? the Christian supremacist so-called white nationalist movement who love Israel and send money to support the settlements and they want all the Jewish Americans to go and live in the settlements for the sake of re-establishing the ancient kingdom of Israel so that this will bring about the end of days and the coming of you know who Jesus Christ, whose real name is Yehoshua ben Yusuf. Oh, check this transport out here. I think they're going to make a U-turn. Yes, here they come. Okay, they're coming down a, uh, a road into the village. Okay, there goes the donkey in the cart. Okay, so how are the designers going to strategize a fourth wave of immigration to fill up the West Bank? and uh, they have their allies going working for them okay now these allies you know love Israel right so but they hate Jewish people you know because you know they want to make a Christian country which is what the United States of America is and they want to keep it for themselves and just as they took it away from the First Nations they want to keep it for themselves again by inducing the departure or expulsion of the Jewish Americans, Jewish Canadians and Jewish South Americans to go to, yes, you know it, Palestine. Okay. The plan is, which is already you know, 
outlined and reported even in the uh, Israeli press, is to have another wave of two million immigrants coming from those countries which are the Christian nation states, which are their allies. So how would that come about? Well, you know, oh, there's another jeep there. The uh, massacre of the uh, synagogue, uh, the Tree of Life synagogue in uh, Pittsburgh is the beginning of such a campaign. The ideological Protestant evangelical theology that rejects catechism is anti-Jewish in such a theological way that cannot even be attributed to the Roman Catholic Church or the Russian Orthodox Church. Yeah, even the Roman Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church do not truly possess this type of ideological anti-Semitism. A Zionist is a house Jew. A Bundist is a field Jew. To prevent Zionist white supremacist alliance from taking us and shoving us in Israel, self-defense and a rejection of pseudo-Jewish nonviolence that should not belong to us must be rejected. It is necessary for us to promote Jewish self-defense and reject the suicidal Jewish nonviolence, which does not work and can never work. Now remember, you have been warned to go back to watch part one and part two first before you get into this, if you have not. Hanatov wanted it expressed that everything that Dr. Wives filed expresses here is correct, except that aside from fallacious Western propaganda, she has found no clear evidence of the doctor's plot being a campaign targeting Jewish people for being Jewish. However, the anti-Semitism of Russia was very real, she acknowledges. One thing we have found is that Joseph Stalin was the disciple of Vladimir Lenin and that he held no ideas of his own. All his thoughts were truly Vladimir Lenin's thoughts. Yet when push came to shove, Joseph Stalin resorted to Russian nationalism. And his reinstating of the Russian Orthodox Church was part of this and essential because if you get into the national question there wouldn't have been a Russian nation as Russia was considered the prison house of several nations. Correctly this was identified in fact by Joseph Stalin in the national question. However we see that Stalin was trusted by Lenin. Uh, Joseph Stalin was trusted by Vladimir Lenin. He was trusted by Vladimir Lenin to write the masterpiece known as The National Question, which is actually a, a book that no one had ever done before, and it achieved stuff that no other book had done before, but it was still flawed, and we can outdo it. But by not throwing it away, but by providing an answer to it. So, Stalin was trusted by Lenin. Stalin was also trusted by Lenin to write his masterpiece, Dialectical Materialism, a book that was heavily used by the Black Panther Party, and now we are using it too. Now, I would like to point out that although I too am skeptical of the doctor's plot being a campaign to target Russian Jewry, I can't confirm that this is propaganda or not propaganda, but everything else that doctor says here is verifiable, for sure, without question or reservation. Everything Dr. Weisfels is saying here on the Russian context, including Stalin's instituting of Russian nationalism. Some might find it perplexing, even that, that some would find it perplexing that Stalin wrote about the national question, given that, that he did institute Russian nationalism, which there was no need to because there had not been any confusion of nation and statehood with them as the national question rightfully identifies that Russia is a place of many nations, a country with many nations. So the perplexing Russian nationalism instituted by Joseph Stalin may seem perplexing to those who have read the national question. However, theory and practice do not always correspond. This was sort of true with Lenin as well. Lenin actually dissolved the Soviets whether he wanted to or not, or was he pressured to, or was, was conditions forced to, these, these are different questions to ask, although it was detrimental 
uh, difficult for the being of the Russians as a whole that Vladimir Lenin did this. Uriah Dia, our councilman of national affairs, will be writing his commentary on the national question into our manifesto for the Bundist movement. We find it more dialectical to answer Stalin as opposed to throwing him away. Within Marxism, the Judophobic anti-Semitism does not originate from Stalin or Lenin. It originates from Karl Marx himself. This is one of the reasons why classical Marxists who reject Lenin and Luxembourg are for the most part anti-Semitic Eurocentric bigots. To the credit of both Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky, they distance somewhat from George William Frederick Haeckel in their dialectical work. Now, according to Isaiah P. Kometstein, it is, it is our ability to challenge many fallacious assumptions of Frederick Engels and Karl Marx in a way no other people can. And that this will improve our dialectics. Marx and Engels were, after all, historical revisionists. According to myself, Miriam Emmesberg and Isaiah P. Kometstein and several other really good historical investigators, we find that they were historical revisionists, that there was plenty of history to take from that was solid and verifiable that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels threw away for their own Euro-chauvinistic viewpoints. And one must not forget that they were part of the Hegelian Society, and a prerequisite to the Hegelian Society was Eurocentric historical revisionism. And this does cripple, this cripples dialectics. As good as dialectics be, this cripples dialectics. So in order to uh, strengthen the dialectic, we have to throw away certain Hegelian shells and just discard them. And this does mean that if you took the writings of Marx and Engels, both would be only, well, no, Marx would be cut down to a half and Hegel would be, Hegel would be cut down to a fourth. That's how much they're not very relevant. They're relevant in the sense that Karl Marx identified the problems of the free market, uh, Engels identified certain concepts that are essential today, but nonetheless, we, it, it is not revisionist to reject most of Marx and Engels if you know that they are the historical revisionists to begin with. Now, they did do monumental things, and so you keep whatever is good. It's, it's the Jewish concept of taking the pit, spitting it out, but eating the fruit. Which is how we should approach both Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Now, I would like to personally, in the strongest way I can, with my relations to the Eastern Bloc, fully confirm what Dr. Weisfeld says here about that, indeed, it is true that Germany became a favorable site for Russian Jewry to immigrate to. Yet, indeed, the Zionist state coerced Germany into instituting anti-Jewish policies. Germany should have done more to oppose this. Someone such as myself is rather indifferent to them making any claims uh, as to being uh, labeled anti-Semitic by the Zionist state if they let Jewish people in. I really don't care if a Nazi past is thrown in anyone's face. Uh, you know, um, you should still stand your ground anyway, because there was a history of Zionists working with Nazis, as both Nazis and Zionists are confirmed as fascists. So, no sympathy from me. So there's a sort of, you know, a cold civil war happening in the United States in which the Christian supremacists are heavily armed, organized into militias, and are starting to uh, attack the Afro-Americans, the Mexica, uh, people living in the United States, and uh, Jewish Americans as well all under the uh, rubric of the um, President Trump campaign against um, immigrants who are not European Christians. So, that's how the two million Jewish refugees are being planned for by the uh, Zionists militia, uh, Zionist, you know, uh, state, which expects 
to be able to induce the immigration of two million more Jewish people into the occupied West Bank here by the force of their anti-Semitic allies who will expel the Jewish people from those countries which they wish to transform into Christian nation states, pure Christian nation states, as in, you know, Nazi Germany, which sent a bunch of soldiers out, you know, to occupy all of Europe and anywhere else that they could get to, with belt buckles that said, Gott mit uns, which means God is with us. More Palestinian workers coming in. This man has a gray beard. He's still working. Yeah, so the radiology is Gott mit uns. And coincidentally, Trump comes from a Jewish American family and is quoted as saying that he's proud of his German blood. Now, you would think that this is a, a statement that is rather sort of, you know, um, as we say in French, farfelu, uh, um, a statement which is, you know, sort of ridiculous. But consider uh, the fact that and this is not uh, reported on. In the American population, 25% of the American population are German Americans, who are a majority of the um, North Midwest American states. 26% are Anglo American. 11%, no, 17% are Afro American. And about 15% uh, are uh, uh, Mexica or Spanish-speaking Americans. So, the uh, 25 and the 26 percent of uh, Americans who are of European origin are freaking out because they're beginning to be a minority. And they want to retain control over the political culture and the political apparatus and state of America. And the way to, for them to do so is to stop abortions the way to do so is to stop immigration that does not come from Europe and also to expel those who are already you know immigrated to the United States there's 11 million um, uh, undocumented workers in the United States working for cheap wages and keeping the American economy afloat from uh, Central America and South America then there's the Jewish Americans who can conveniently be uh, sent away under pressure or fear for their lives to, yes, Palestine. It all fits together. So that would be the fourth wave of immigration that uh, the Zionist strategy is seeking in order to um, maintain uh, control over the entire territory of Palestine and uh, make life so miserable for the Palestinians that there's a new candidate in the Israel election who may be gaining support called Fagel, who is uh, has a strategy of his own uh, that accompanies all of this which is to induce the uh, the uh, uh, emigration of the Palestinians by offering them money to leave Palestine and uh, this is a strategy that uh, has some uh, traction to it you know because life is so difficult here for the Palestinians you know uh, every family has uh, has uh, people uh, in it, uh, members of their families, all families have members who have been in prison, who who are in prison, or who have been killed as martyrs, Shahid. So, to she seek a, a country that uh, and live in peace, you know, is what many Palestinians want. And if they can get um, paid to go and, and leave, you know, that they would uh, perhaps, you know, take up such an opportunity, except for the fact that. Uh, the other countries to which they want to emigrate to will not give them a visa. So, the Zionist strategy is sort of in a bind, and uh, we'll see what's going to happen in the election tomorrow. Yes, the Israel election is tomorrow. Now, what's the forecast for the Israel election tomorrow? Well, Netanyahu has proposed the annexation of the settlements and the outposts in the West Bank. Oh yes, by the way, we're still waiting for Gadir to be released from the prison over there. Perhaps they see that there are so many people waiting here for her to be released that they're delaying her release in order to induce people to leave because they don't want this to become 
too much of a victorious event. It's all psychological warfare. Okay, so we continue to wait. Kadir will come. Now, there's the moon again. It's difficult to get a focus now that there's very little uh, light left in a day. But uh, the election, Israel election now, coming up tomorrow, what's going to happen? Now, the Attorney General of Israel, you know, the chief lawyer of the country, of the state, no, not of the state, of the country, because the judicial apparatus is independent of the state. It's supposed to be a, a checks and balances, you know, provision of liberal democracy in which the judiciary can tell the, the government, you know, to get lost. You know, if the government passes a law which is unconstitutional or undemocratic, you know, the judiciary, like the Supreme Court, can tell them, you know, the law um, is not um, legal anymore and is cancelled. Now, there's one candidate from one of the right-wing uh, parties in coalition with Netanyahu, Ayat Shaked, who put out, you know, a video, publicity for herself, promoting a perfume called fascism. And, uh, it, you know, she's serious. And she is uh, advocating the um, um, taking over the Supreme Court so that the appointments to the Supreme Court are made by a governmental committee and not by a commission of, uh, of uh, judges. One thing. Secondly, she wants the uh, Israel Parliament to have the authority, the power to overrule the Supreme Court. So instead of the Supreme Court overruling the Parliament, she wants the Parliament to be able to overrule the Supreme Court, the, which is sort of, you know, like, uh, sort of uh, bizarre, you know, because if the Parliament, Knesset, you know, passes a law which is undemocratic and the Supreme Court says it's undemocratic, then uh, she wants, you know, the uh, Parliament to have a, the power to pass another law saying that they uh, want to pass the law anyway, even though the Supreme Court, you know, has declared it to be undemocratic. To which the Supreme Court could reply, presumably, to say that no, that law, in addition, is also undemocratic, and more so. Uh, and uh, with the intention to overrule the Supreme Court definitively, this would require, essentially, a uh, coup d'etat, political coup d'etat, to destroy, you know, the, uh, the democratic control of the Supreme Court over the Knesset, which is rather limited to begin with. So, that's one of the political parties in tomorrow's uh, lineup. Netanyahu himself, on behalf of the Likud party, which is expected to uh, get um, about 26% uh, of the vote. Oh, here's some police. Huh? He doesn't want it? No video? Okay, no video. It is, it is of no surprise that Benjamin Netanyahu won the election for the Zionist state. And we need to document every move that Dr. Weisfeld makes public to us because we fear for him. And we're not sure what's going to happen as time passes. Now, I have tried so hard to bring these events to the press, and the only press that took this up at all was Jason Unruh. And he did so rather sincerely. And, and that's one of the reasons why I've lost my patience with a lot of people who consistently diss Maoist rebel news. I actually have been watching Jason Unruh for years, but, you know, whatever. What do I know? But I would like to say if Jason Unruh ever sees this video, which I don't think he will because, you know, he's extremely busy all the time. But if he catches this, I just would like to say thank you very much. I want to give you my personal gratitude, comrade, for...
putting up that video you did on your channel concerning the arrest and detention and torture of Dr. Abram Weisfeld and the internationals and the Palestinians with him. I hope this video was educational and enlightening. I hope that this will please all of us here in the Bundist movement as well, and I hope that everybody will be staying tuned for part four. Part four of release day. Now I say as a Sephardi, that is a Jewish, a Jewish Al-Andalusia, otherwise known as a Sephardi, Palestina libre libre ma'asalama shalom adio.